Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am very pleased to have Jeffrey West on the podcast. Jeffrey is a theoretical physicist who has been studying physics, elementary particles, and their interactions. He is the Shannon Distinguished Professor and past president at the Santa Fe Institute. He has a long-term interest in scaling phenomenon and how that works with biology and how that also works with cities. Um, he is a fellow of the American Physical Society, one of their speakers in 2003. He has been a lecturer in many places, uh, including the World Economic Forum. Um, he, in 2006, he was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World. And his work has been used in Breakthrough Ideas of 2007 by Harvard Business Review. He's written many books, including the most recent one, which is the one we talk about in the conversation, Scale, The Universal Laws of Life, Growth, and Death in Organisms, Cities, and Companies. Jeffrey is a very wonderful man, um, very kind, very generous, and just absolutely brilliant. Um, we had a really, really nice conversation for two hours on the book and many of the contents in the book. I'd say the first hour is devoted to what scale uh, is and what it looks like in the natural and biological world. And I'd say the second hour is about what scale looks like and the, the laws of scale uh, for cities, um, which is really kind of how his book kind of works out as well. Uh, we start the conversation by talking about what is scale and how that's defined. Uh, we talk about scaling laws. We talk about the metabolic rate and why that's important and how that's measured on the logarithmic scale. We talk about three-fourths and the magic number four, which is just astounding stuff. We talk about growth and metabolic rate. Um, and then we talk about growth and scale as it's applied to aging. You know, How long can we live? Why do we you know, really don't live past 120 at a very, very, very top maximum level. We talk about the role of temperature on metabolism. Uh, we talk about fractals, which are also very fascinating. Um, we talk about how fractals and scale work in cities. We talk about the social connectedness and networks of people in cities. We mention how rural areas and small towns and villages um, factor into the scaling theory. And then we end the conversation by talking about how one uh, can work towards a grand unified theory of sustainability and um, some of some of the more recent uh, thoughts that Jeffrey's had about all the ideas about time and space. Uh, again, Jeffrey has been such a groundbreaking thinker, such an original thinker um, in these areas and applying uh, kind of his his training uh, in physics with biology, but then also with companies and cities um, in terms of scale. Um, we mentioned in the conversation, his book is um, pretty dense in some parts, but it is very, very, very good. And it's rich with a lot of information and with a lot of data. And he talks about that in the beginning. And uh, I really can't recommend the book enough. It is It is such a monumental book. Um, and I was, again, just super grateful that he agreed to come on the, on the podcast and talk to us all about his, his work, his research, his ideas. And so now I bring you Jeffrey West. I'm here with the one and only Jeffrey West. Uh, Jeffrey, thank you so much, uh, for, for coming on the podcast and, and being willing to talk here. It's a, it's a huge honor and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful. So, so uh, big, big thanks. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you for inviting me, Savio, and I look forward to our conversation. Yes, me as well. Um, for folks that don't know who you are, just kind of give us uh, your kind of potted biography and uh, what, you're, what you're up to, uh, I guess, more recently for your research and, and all that good sure. stuff. Um, so, as you said, my name is Jeffrey West. I was, uh, I, I identified myself as a physicist. I spent uh, most of my career um, doing something called high energy physics. That's you know, fundamental questions of, of physics, uh, quarks and gluons and string theory and dark matter and all these wonderful things, which mm -hmm. I very much enjoyed. Um, uh, but um, at some stage, 
uh, beginning in the mid 90s, during the 90s, I sort of almost unconsciously changed fields. It wasn't deliberate. It just happened, so to speak. We might discuss that, but uh, um, it happened. Um, and I, because I got interested in some big questions in biology, which fascinated me. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turned out that um, uh, the work that I did uh, with, with some biologists um, was, a, was a fundamental question um, that uh, is really to do with the big picture of biology, sort of the interconnectivity and integration across all of life. Um, but that sort of changed my career inadvertently, and I became very involved in uh, some of these questions, related questions in biology. And then uh, in more recent years, uh, because of the structure of the kind of theoretical development that I've been involved in, it was very natural to apply some of those ideas to social organizations, in particular to cities and companies. And that also led um, to um, a great interest in the whole question of the survivability and therefore sustainability of um, social organizations and therefore of the kind of socioeconomic life uh, in which we all participate. So one of my um, passions at the moment and uh, in this very latter stage of my career and life is in fact the whole question of global sustainability. Um, can we understand it? Um, can we understand how we got here? What were the driving mechanisms? And then try to think through what are the potential mitigations that we could employ. Um, but I work on many, many different things um, um, at the moment, everything from sleep and brain development um, all the way through to uh, some of these social science questions to do with structure and uh, growth of companies and so on. So it's a, it's a very broad spectrum. And, and that's the kind of way I like to do science. It's yeah. a big picture, a very broad, very yeah. transdisciplinary. Yeah, I, I can imagine taking the uh, <clears throat> physics background as a as a way of looking at that. You know, most physicists yeah. have this way of looking at the very grand picture. You know, we're, yes. we're one speck in a big universe, and how do things connect? And so, I can imagine when you're applying it to biology, to social systems, to to uh, cities, and to organisms and networks, uh, that all kind of starts to kind of collide of sorts in a, in a really nice way in terms of the ideas and everything. <clears throat> so, um, your book is. Uh, incredible. Uh, it's a couple years old now, but uh, the book is called Scale, The Universal Laws of Life, Growth, and Death in Organisms, Cities, and Companies. Um, I've read this book twice now, and um, it, it's, it is really, I, I, I think it's, it's fair to say you're a pretty original thinker, and it is uh, dense in some parts, um, and but in a good way, it's like almost like there's a lot of rich information uh, in each chapter and each chapter kind of sits on its own in some ways. And so um, it's it's wonderful. It, it's also incredible, too, because I've read some books uh, more recently now uh, in a few papers and I will see people uh, cite your work and incite the book and, you know, talk about like, you know, as, as Wes says, you know, in scale and all these things. And it's so cool to see people, uh, kind of cite your work in that way, even, even though this book hasn't, isn't that old, it's I think three or four years old now. So, um, that's a, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful book. It's in paperback now, I think for, it has been for a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, is, um, is there any, any other books you have in, in the works that are kind of a company to this or, or something different or no? Well, that's a very interesting question. When I wrote that book and finished that book, um, so as you said, I mean, the book is, you know, when I, I um, proposed that book and started writing that book, I expected it to be about 150 pages, very modest sized book. Wow. wow. Uh, you know, and, and it turned out to be over three times, maybe even four times, no, mm -hmm. three times that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say. It's about 400 odd pages, I don't remember. Yeah. yeah. And that shocked me. I mean, and I, and I had to leave a lot of stuff out and that shocked me. Mm. Um, <clears throat> uh, but uh, one of the things that uh, I wanted to do in that book was not just explain all these interesting things that I feel I've been involved in and some of the big questions that we all have to face, um, 
but it was also uh, uh, to um, really um, um, highlight science. You know, this is the way you should be thinking about the world around you, was kind of the idea. This is giving you a, a way of looking at the world around, around us. Um, and I had in mind trying to explain everything. I didn't want to pull things out of the hat. Mm. I didn't want to do what often is done in popular science books, which are very good. I'm not, this is, sure. you know, but, but often, you know, it's sort of, uh, as we sometimes say, you know, deus ex machina, you know, mm -hmm. then you just, uh, you just pull this thing. And I decided I wanted to try to explain everything and at the same time do no mathematics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and and do it as if I'm explaining everything to my mother, who was not a very well-educated person, by the way, mm -hmm. um, and certainly didn't know any science. Um, and she's been dead a large number of years now. But that's what I had in mind. And um, <clears throat> in that sense, I did not succeed, mm -hmm. I feel. That is as hard as I can. I mean, thank you very much for your wonderful feedback. And I get <laughs> tremendous feedback on this book. I get... You know, and I'm very flattered and very honored by it and so on. But um, it still requires, as you said, you, you rightly said, there are parts that I think for the lay person or the intelligent lay person, whatever you want to call them, you know, that, that, that is really interested in these kinds of things, it, it requires, um, it does require sitting and thinking at times. I mean, I hate to put it in such simple terms, but you know, you can't just sort of, it's not a, it's, it, parts of it might be a page turner, but some parts you sort of got to think it through a little bit, even though there's no mathematics, it's yes. all in English and so on. And I recognize that. And I'm, um, so now to answer your question, Mm -hmm. Am I thinking of writing it on the book? So when I finished that, I thought there's no way I'm ever going to write another play. <laughs> That's it. But in more recent years, the last couple of years, um, I've become more and more, I've more and more thought about maybe I should um, write another book, um, which would go down yet another level. And not have and and really relieve it of that density that you talked about. And in fact, I realized one of the things that helps me with this. I've written that book, and I can refer to various things in that book if people want to, you know, explore further. And I can just pull things out of the hat. But the hat being my other book, this first book, mm -hmm. and that's sort of my thing. And I'm thinking of doing it more in terms of essays. Mm -hmm. various mm -hmm. subjects, um, even though they're interconnected, less trying to thread everything together in a more linear fashion, mm -hmm. a little bit more non-linear mm -hmm. and a little more popular. And if I could do it, which I don't think I'm very good at, maybe I'll try it a little more journalistic. Mm -hmm. So moving a more, I mean, I hate to say moving towards a Malcolm Gladwell kind of yeah. thing. Um, I admire for what he does, even though when I read it, I get pissed off all the time because he does pull things out of the hat and he doesn't substantiate things and all that. But it's a very easy read and it does, serves an important purpose in society in, in this interface with, with science. And I don't think I have that talent, but I want, but I just want to take that as something to aspire to in terms of doing, if I do decide to write such a book. And by the way, the, the theme of the book will be a coupling of two things. One is the whole, we have part of the theme running through it will be time, mm. various aspects of time and the acceleration of time of our, uh, which I talk about a little bit in this, in the book. Mm -hmm. and and uh, its relationship to whether we can sustain this extraordinary socioeconomic mm -hmm. universe that we've created. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be underlying, but I'll talk about many different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it reminds me of, um, uh, I think, the book you're describing in terms of the format is, uh, I think Carlo Rovelli writes a lot of these types of books. He does. That's what I'm talking about. I've not read his books, funnily enough. I, I know who he is, of course. And yeah. I don't know him. I... Um, we've never crossed paths, but we will uh, probably this year, funnily enough. Mm -hmm. um, 
But yes, I think I will. Uh, I will move more in that direction. I yeah. decided that's. Uh, um, you know, I, I think um, to to broaden the audience. I mean, this this did extremely well. It was quote a bestseller in terms of its areas. Well, it has point. a very grand scale, uh, yeah. no pun intended. I mean, it is, yeah. it is, uh, it is, it is grand, and I totally agree. There are certain parts of the book, and and maybe certain chapters where you have to kind of read that chapter very slowly and yes. kind of sit with it, and maybe take a day or two, and then you come back to it. And and uh, and it's not because I mean the writing's great, the the content's great. It's just a lot of things to kind of download of sorts. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. No, I think that's right. And, yeah. uh, you know, and I, I tried not to do that, but I knew at times I couldn't avoid it. Um, but I, I'm going to try to get away from that a bit and a little more essay style. Yeah. No, uh, I think that's great. Yeah. And, and I don't know whether I can do it, and uh, but I had, um, I thought in the next uh, couple of months, I'm going to just start, you know, in, in the morning, try to give that a go and see whether that. Uh, if, it, if I feel comfortable with it. I, by the way, I'm not, I labor my writing. I mean, that's one of the things, I'm not a natural writer. You know, I mean, there's many of these people, uh, many of the, the well-known science writers and scientists write, yeah. um, write. You know, they have, they sit there and they just write. Mm -hmm. I can sit there from nine to 12 in the morning and at the end, I have about two sentences. <laughs> and I've written so many versions of it back and forth. Um, it, it's really, you know, that's yeah. I'm I'm a I'm an, I'm a totally unwarranted perfectionist in that regard. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. And and very successful writers, some of whom are extremely well known, have said to me, uh, "This is before I started writing. You know, I was thinking of doing it." They were very encouraging, and they said, "However, one of the things you should do is you should sit down every day and write. Yeah, don't don't keep trying to correct it. Just yeah. do it, yeah. even if it you know just do it. You're going to." And I tried that. I couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, I've got the same advice. I'm not a natural writer either. I think I'm okay, and uh, I don't write anything prolific. But I, every I just I. I'm so disciplined for so many things and I'm just, that's one thing I'm just yeah. not disciplined and I wish I was. And so yeah. hopefully, hopefully, I, uh, you know, uh, no, I think with, about. with, you know, if I were younger, if I were your age, maybe, and I decided I'd like to write, mm -hmm. um, um, I suspect, um, after a while, and I could find that towards the end of the writing period. Um, I think, uh, one learns, of course, like everything else. And, um, I think, uh, it becomes easier becomes much easier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't know whether now it's been three or four years since I've written in this. I've written several, I have written in the meantime, several essays in various journals, you know, popular journals kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, even those I, I have found I've labored. So I, it's going to be interesting to see. The other thing I'd like to have a go at which I've refrained from doing, I was originally asked, uh, invited to do some, and I did not do it, is opinion pieces. Mm -hmm. They're really popular. I mean, go to the sort of New York Times, Washington Post, if they're still interested kind of thing, mm -hmm. write, mm -hmm. some, write something that, uh, yeah. but, um, that requires another special skill. Uh, that's a, that's another, that's another skill. Absolutely. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, well, look, I mean, I will look forward to whatever you put well, this out. This is all speculative in my head at the moment. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's we'll good speak. though. It's good. It's good. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about, uh, uh, many of the things in, in your wonderful book scale. So let's start with, uh, terms, I guess. So scale is, is, is tremendous for so many things in our material world. And I, I can't help but think that I, I'm referencing this concept of scaling in so many things uh, in terms of many things will work one to one or in a, on an individual level. But my next question always becomes, well, how do, this is a scaling problem. We can't scale this upwards. And you could see this for so many things in the world. And so maybe define for us. Um, the differences of, so what is scale, scalability, and super linear scaling? How do you yeah. understand yeah. these terms? So scale of itself or scaling is a, a very sort of very simple minded concept. 
Um, it's it's um, simply that, uh, you know, take any system, whether it's an uh, automobile, uh, a human being, um, an economy, whatever, and uh, you just increase its size, you double the size, and you ask, you know, um, uh, you know what, is, what happens to that uh, system? Uh, does it still function in the same way? What are the various parameters that describe it? Uh, how do they change? Um, if I double, if I were twice the size I am, do I sleep twice as long? Obviously, the answer is no. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but uh, you know, so what? What is the answer to that? That kind of question. So it's very simple in principle, and um, it, it actually goes back to the very beginnings of modern science, which I think you, one can. Um, identify Galileo as sort of the first modern scientist um, with his marvelous works. Um, but he actually, in, um, in one of his uh, famous books called The um, Dialogues Concerning the Two New Sciences, um, he has a dialogue um, about scale. Hmm. And in fact, the question is, what happens if you scale up a tree or if you scale up a building and um, you just keep scaling it up, you keep doubling its size. And he points out that the fundamental laws of physics say that it will eventually collapse. Uh, and um, he realized that um, the only way you can um, keep the same functionality going um, is either you change the architecture, the engineering of it, so that, as you know, as you obviously, as the building gets bigger or an animal gets bigger, um, and the, the pillars holding up the building or the legs holding up the animal have to get thicker and thicker mm -hmm. relative to the size of the object. So an elephant's legs are big, fat things, mm -hmm. whereas a dog's are nice, thin, elegant things and so on. And that's, fun, that's driven primarily by the fundamental laws of physics. Mm -hmm. and the laws of the scaling and how those laws scale. And so, um, and similarly with buildings. So the first thing is either you have to change the, the design, the architecture, or you have to uh, change the materials. Mm -hmm. um, so that, um, you know, you, you, could, you can cross a small creek or a, um, a small stream with a wooden bridge, but you can't cross the San Francisco Bay that way. Uh -huh. You had to make there. You you know by the time you get to something that big, you've not only had to change the design. You don't just build a simple bridge across. You have to have a suspension bridge um, with a engineered, and you have to use um, steel and uh, concrete and so on. So um, it, it's it's so it's it, it's all around us, um, and so that so scaling is. Um, you can see the world around us through the lens of scaling in that yeah. way, just asking how you scale. Now, now um, <clears throat> as a corollary to that, um, there are different kinds of scaling. I mean, there's the, the simplest kind of scaling is if you double the size of something, everything in it doubles. Well, mm -hmm. it rarely happens, but that does happen for sure. But um, sometimes and most times um, when you scale, um, you either get more per size of the system or less per size if you get more. So if you, um, um, and maybe we'll come and talk about this, if you double the size of a city, would you expect to have twice as many, twice the length of all the roads? Well, naively you might, but it turns out you don't. You don't need it because there's a kind of economy of scale. And the bigger, if you, the bigger the city, actually the less length of roads you need. Hmm. So, and that's called sublinear scaling. And that represents uh, what economists call an economy of scale. The bigger you are, the less you need, um, so to speak, per person for the transport system. Hmm. Uh, but you can have the opposite phenomenon. Um, you already mentioned it, superlinear scaling. And that is, um, there are socioeconomic quantities in a city like um, the GDP of a city. The GDP of a city, if you double the size of a city, you might again naively expect it as GDP to simply double 
But on average, that is not the case. The bigger the city, actually, the more the GDP increases. It increases more than twice. Mm. And that's called superlinear scaling. I guess the, the the questions I have there are are twofold. So, so I, I'll I'll uh, I'll ask the the two subcategories and then one one uh, sub point under it. There, you you mentioned I think in the first part of the book that there's a way in which we understand how scale works in the natural world within biology, and <clears throat> and so how do we understand? For example, uh, it was Darwin, right, that said that you know how we. One of the ways in which we understand evolution is kind of goes to your engineering pieces. How, how we understand intermediary species is that they have sometimes a change in function, right, right. And so, you know, how does a fish get, you know, to uh, this is one of the still one of the puzzling things in, in evolution? But how do we get from fish to get to on land? Right. And there are certain parts of their body, but it, it's not that they get new parts. It's that their, their parts over time can change in function. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I guess my question here is what does just generally we'll get to it later. But what does the differences in how scaling works for um, kind of the the organic or biological world mm-hmm. and the non or the material world, such as cities and um things that we build that are man-made? How, how does it look, I guess, conceptually different? Well, in many ways, they're not so different. I mean, okay. uh, the, because you have the same problem, hmm. just as I mentioned before. I mean, I just talked about animals and uh, buildings, for example, and they satisfy the same kind of laws and they have the same constraints. Hmm. And, um, you know, I mean, in, in, um, in terms of uh, animals, um, you can keep scaling keep scaling up. And of course, you adapt um, to um, different environmental conditions uh-huh. as, uh, as size increases, but you adapt to environmental conditions. And that's why, of course, animals look different because they're dealing with very different challenges in their evolutionary history. Um, but you can ask the question, um, can you go on doing that indefinitely? Mm. I mean, can you have a Godzilla? <laughs> right, right. You know, I mean, uh, and the answer is no, you can't actually. Mm-hmm. Godzilla would collapse under his or her own weight, mm-hmm. um, given the size that Godzilla is proposed to have had. Or right, had. right, right. <laughs> um, and indeed, we reach that probably with land animals, um, with dinosaurs, right. and, and so on. But uh, and uh, we may have reached it even earlier with mammals. I mean, uh, um, there have been enormously sized animal uh, mammals that have disappeared. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, uh, because you reach the limit of the constraints of the physical laws, but actually we subverted those as mammals. We just think of ourselves only as mammals. We subverted those by realizing that the thing that was limiting us, we're realizing, I mean, this is the process of natural selection, <laughs> right. not, not design, uh, that was the, the possibility existed that you that the, the, the real constraint was gravity. Gravity was was the big the, the big constraint. And one can be relieved of gravity by going into the ocean. And indeed, as you well, everybody knows, mammals return to the ocean. And so the biggest animal, the biggest um, probably organism that's ever existed is alive today in, the, in terms of the blue whale. Um, the blue whale doesn't have to fight gravity, but it has to fight other things. Uh-huh. And maybe later we'll come back to that. It's very likely, I think, that the blue whale has pretty much reached the limits of what the mammalian um, engineered, evolved engineered design can do in terms of size. And so you have to change things. So you can also ask the following, you know, um, uh, if you wanted to have um, um, something the size of Godzilla, or if you wanted to have um, a mammal that could fly, it could be, you know, really, um, a, 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 an enormous, uh, an elephant that could fly, of course, that doesn't seem to make sense. Well, we've actually, natural selection has solved that problem. And how did it do it? It evolved us, it evolved our brain, it evolved our 
how clever our intelligence, and we built something we called aeroplanes, mm -hmm. <laughs> which, you know, mm -hmm. you know, so they are, you know, that's how natural selection has made extraordinary large birds, mm -hmm. is uh, this devious route. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's quite complex if one starts thinking about it, uh, this interplay between physical constraints, which is what I'm interested in, on, on body size, body plans, and so on, um, and evolutionary forces. Yeah. Well, that, that, that was that was my point. Uh, my next point was, you know, how how much is complexity and this idea of growth? How are those uh, kind of some of the the essential features of how we understand scaling? Right. You, you were just describing how it's very complex. It, it seems like that's a key component to things. So the complexities of things and how we understand how organisms grow or how cities grow sure. or just how things scale. So how does growth and complexity work here? Well, then we have to go back to something we haven't yet discussed, mm -hmm. which is scaling laws. Okay. <laughs> go, go ahead. And, Tell and, us. And, Tell us about the laws. laws. First of all, scaling laws. And, um, and then uh, what is the origin of these laws? Mm -hmm. So um, let me just back off now mm -hmm. a little bit. So, um, the, and in fact, the thing that got me excited and interested in all this work while I was doing, you know, string theory of quarks and gluons, mm -hmm. <laughs> got me excited was that I became aware of these um, so-called allometric scaling laws. Now, this is all it means is that uh, and here's the most fundamental one. The most fundamental one is to do with metabolic rate because metabolic rate is the most fundamental quantity associated with any living organism or any living system in that matter. Mm -hmm. And it just simply means how much energy or how much food is needed per second or per day to stay alive. Mm -hmm. And ours is the canonical sort of 2,000 food calories a day. Mm -hmm. um, so um, back in uh, the early 1930s, a biologist named Max Kleiber um, put together, I think he also did some measurements, but mostly he put together a whole bunch of data um, on metabolic rate of different animals, um, ranging from, I think, I, don't, I think the smallest might have been the mouse, but all the way up to, um, actually he estimated it even for the whale. Mm. certainly up through the elephant the world. and he plotted these um, and found that they followed a very simple regular curve very very simple law and the law was roughly speaking and now i'm going to translate that law into english uh, let me just say what it is for those that are familiar with it if you plot it logarithmically so here i'm going to say something slightly technical but it doesn't matter for what one that one is going to proceed but if you plot it logarithmically, which means you go up by factors of 10, mm -hmm. one gram, 10 grams, 100 grams, and so on, and, and so forth, um, you plot the, the, the size and you plot the metabolic rate versus the size logarithmically, what he discovered was something extraordinary. The, the points lay on, an, on a straight line. It was the simplest possible thing that you could imagine. <laughs> this was this is astounding if you think about it, yes. because we're dealing with maybe first of all the most complex phenomenon maybe in the universe for all we know, that is metabolism, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the sustenance of, of life, um, and and each one of the organisms that is metabolizing has a unique historical history. I mean, it's evolved by natural selection in some what we often think of naively maybe as some random process uh, that's highly historically contingent not only the whole um, organism but every subsystem every cell type every genome and so on and yet you know so given that you would think with all that randomness and all that historical contingency the points would lie sort of not exactly randomly, but scattered mm -hmm. across the entire graph. Quite the contrary. He found them on this beautiful straight line. Um, and not only that, he found that the slope of that straight line was very, very close to the number three quarters. Yeah. So this was sort of like, wow, you know. So it's um, that led to, over the ensuing years, 
to uh, people measuring and they're plotting in a similar way every physiological quantity you could think of and every life history event you could think of. How long you take to reach maturity, how many offspring you have, what's the length of your aorta, how long you live, um, et cetera, et cetera. And what was discovered, amazingly, was that all of them scaled just like that metabolic rate. Namely, if you plot them on this, this logarithmic way, going up by factors of 10, they all follow straight lines as if you know something incredibly simple is going on. So um, this was important stuff in biology during the 30s and, and uh, in the early 40s, but then it was completely eclipsed by the molecular revolution um, and the, and, and the uh, discovery of the structure of DNA. And uh, so I went way on to the back burner without a general explanation being put forward. And it just sort of was, I wouldn't say forgotten, that's for sure, but it was neglected for sure, that is, that is for sure. And uh, I came across this because I was originally, because I was teaching um, biology and pre-medical students um, physics, elementary physics. <laughs> and instead of giving canonical physics examples of pendulums and inclined planes and all those boring kind of things, I thought <laughs> I'd better give them, find some biological examples. And I came across this and it stuck with me. <laughs> and so somewhere in the 90s, I started thinking about this and uh, I started to think about what is the origin of this? When, how does this come from? You know, how can all these different things, there must be some fundamental theory. And to cut to the chase, I propose that um, the origin of this is that something that connects all organisms, all organisms, from the, uh, the, the microscopic to the macroscopic, whether they're plants, fish, uh, mammals, or birds, and that is they all ultimately function by networks that in order to function, and in fact, that's true of almost all systems, in order to function, you have to distribute, if you have this highly complex system with 100 trillion cells, you have to supply all of those, roughly speaking, democratically and efficiently with energy and resources. And of course, you know how you do that. You know how that nature has done it. It's evolved networks cardiovascular systems and respiratory systems and uh, renal systems and so on, all of which do something like that. So um, I then started working on the mathematics of these networks within the context of biological organisms. And then um, I, during that, when I figured I sort of got it, was beginning to get it straight, I was very fortunate in meeting marvelous biologist named Jim Brown, a very well-known ecologist, actually was president, president of the American uh, Ecological Association at the time, and who was very interested in these things. And to cut it again, a long story short, he and I, and then his student, Brian Enquist, um, derived the theory for uh, where these come from. And to put it in simple terms, it's the mathematics, geometry, and the fundamental principles governing the networks that give rise to all these marvelous scaling laws, because the idea is that these networks, these properties transcend the design because they're all trying to do the same thing, mm. they're all trying to sort of optimize the way distribution is, is to the cells and uh, to minimize energy, for example. Uh, so, so for example, your, your circulatory system has evolved from this point of view so as to minimize the amount of energy your heart has to do to supply energy to your cells, it minimizes it so that it can maximize the amount of energy you can allocate to sex and reproduction, the rearing of children and the propagation of genes. Mm -hmm. So that was very nice. So, so, so what is extraordinary, going back to your original question, you have these probably 75 of such scaling laws all with the same kind of structure with these very simple straight lines on a logarithmic plot. And that simply represents 
in technical language, something called a power law, where it's really it has to be called a power law. And the slope of that line is called the exponent. And for metabolic rate, it's three quarters. Even more extraordinary was that for all 50 or 75 of these physiological and life history metrics, the exponent is always a simple multiple of one quarter. <laughs> so your heart rate decreases with a slope of minus one quarter, for example. Just to give you another example, um, and so on. So, um, uh, and the theory explains that. The, the theory explains where this magic number four comes from. It's the number of life. That's what is ubiquitous around us. You don't see that number, but it's <laughs> operating all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now going to your original question, which is about growth. Yeah. Was that this theory, once you have one of the wonderful things about physics, is that even though you know this theory is a crude theory actually it's a you know it's not a it's not like newton's laws it's what we call a coarse grain theory it gives you sort of the average properties of any organism um, even though it, it's a crude theory it is mathematical it's analytic and it's highly predictive and you can apply it because it's a generic network theory to any system to do with organisms mm. and one of the things you can apply it to is growth mm. and you can say you know what is growth within this um, uh, conceptual framework well in this framework all, all it what it means is the following is you eat you metabolize the metabolic energy so to speak is sent through the networks to feed the cells and at the cellular level it, it uh, repairs damage that has been done or replaces ones that have died, and then it adds new ones. Mm. And so that network is the thing that's driving that. And um, you have to, you have the theory, you put it into the mathematics that what I just said, that idea that metabolic energy is being allocated between repair, maintenance on the one hand, and growth on the other. And uh, out pops a fantastic explanation for why you grow quickly when you're young and then you stop. Hmm. And uh, it, that's called sigmoidal growth, technically. So you grow quickly and then you stop, as we do, and most organisms do, not all, and the theory can explain that. But, um, and, and the reason that you stop is extremely interesting. It's that, and I just want to spend a minute on it because it's, it's important. Yeah, and that is the theory predicted, if you like, or post-dicted, that metabolic rate would scale with this three-quarters slope. Mm -hmm. Three-quarters is sublinear, in terms of the language I introduced earlier, mm -hmm. less than one, and that means an economy of scale. So put in a slightly different language, it means that the bigger the animal, the less energy each cell has to do. So that's the cells sort of slow down the bigger you are. And indeed, that's one of the reasons why big animals live much longer than little ones systematically, because they, their, their, their cells are not working as hard. So your cells are working less hard than your dogs, but your horses are working even less hard and then systematically up, according to a mathematical law. Um, so um, the supply of energy, the metabolic energy, is per cell is decreasing as you grow. So as you grow from an infant all the way up to adulthood, um, the supply of energy through that network to a cell is decreasing as you grow. And it's forced on it by the net, by this net, the, the mathematics of the network. Now, um, uh, on the other hand, if you're growing, you're growing sort of in a linear fashion. As you grow, you just keep linearly adding cells. Mm -hmm. And if you're increasing something linearly, so if you double the size, you're twice, twice as many cells. But if you double the size, you only have, roughly speaking, um, 1.7 as much metabolic energy, supplying twice as many cells. And that keeps decreasing. And eventually, the supply of energy can't keep up with the additional growth, and you stop. And the theory predicts that, and 
you can drive these marvelous curves for any animal and see the great universality of, of life across these growth curves. And one of the pretty things that comes out of the theory is it tells you how to rescale your growth as you're growing and rescale your age in such a way that everybody appears to be growing in the same way. Hmm. And uh, so it's a very pretty theory and it, it, it's given how simple it is in, in principle, because it's only to do with flows of energy, so to speak, through networks. Um, it is. It has enormous predictive power. Hmm. Yeah, it's uh, absolutely, you know, wonderful how you described it. It's, it's really it, it makes a lot of intuitive sense in in some ways, right? You know, you laying it out, it's easy to follow. It's fascinating to me how so many things in 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 the natural world are following on these three quarters and quarter kinds of uh, principles across the board is 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 hmm. is spectacular. Uh, kind of going back to the animal so there's it seems right like if the blue whale if its metabolism has or its cells have less work to do because it's such a large animal it's going to live longer and you have you know rodents your mice or or insects they're going to live much shorter lives right. and so does that mean i guess for humans there's really nothing we can do because of the laws of biology and then the physical ways of understanding that to extend our lives. But, but in a, in a, in a certain sense, let me ask you this way in a certain sense. So 120 years ago, people didn't live as long. The average age was, was shorter because of disease, because of, you know, we have modern yeah. medicine and things like that. But it, I would imagine modern medicine itself has limits too within the 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 boundaries of uh, physical and biological laws there's just there's going to be a, a, a unless you're starting to talk about artificial or partially synthetic kind of sure. you know, that's maybe different but mm -hmm. in terms of how we are there's always going to be a a limit because of these uh, uh metrics in this geometry um for the system that is most mammals is, is that about right or, or can we can yes we so let me say, yes yes so let me expand on that and in fact i might say and i, I didn't say this at the beginning but this whole question of lifespan mm -hmm. was what inspired me actually uh to start start thinking seriously about all of this stuff mm -hmm. and these scaling laws i mentioned that i'd come across Kleiber's law for metabolic rate, three quarters um, in teaching. Um, and it always intrigued me and I felt someday I must work on it. Uh, but it was as I got older <laughs> and began to realize the, uh, my own, uh, the finiteness of my life, my own mortality, um, in, well into my 50s, I started to think seriously about it. And that, by the way, on a personal note, was primarily because I, come, I happened to come from a, um, a line of short-lived males. Mm. Um, you know, my father, grandfather, etc. All my uncles and great uncles all died, you know, by today's standards, certainly quite young, mm. um, you know, 50s and 60s. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, so here was I in my mid 50s uh, beginning to worry and to think that, well, I might, if at best, I might have 10 years. Mm. But why is that? You know, why, why in any case am I, you know, things changing in me and I'm slowing, obviously slowing down and all the rest of it. Mm. Um, so I became very intrigued and that was a part of the driving force for a lot of this work. So just going back to the argument that I gave, just to again, put it in perspective. So Again, to repeat, metabolic rate is increasing as mass to the three quarters. That's the way we say it with this slope of three quarters, which means that the metabolic rate of a cell in the body is decreasing with size. It's getting, uh, it's getting uh, smaller and smaller, the bigger the um, mammal, for example, is. And so it's doing less work Therefore, it's causing less damage. And here's the important point. It's causing less damage, and therefore, you live longer. I mean, you do repair damage, but uh, you, okay. So, uh, and from that, you can derive the scaling of lifespan. And the scaling of lifespan, according to this, uh, should be, um, on average, um, increasing with a slope of one quarter. 
And um, indeed, um, if you look at the data, the data has tremendous variance in it. That's partly because there is good data on lifespan because um, people haven't looked at it as a dedicated quantity to look at across many animals. Um, and many, some of them are from data collected in the wild and animals, of course, die of predation, not of natural causes. Um, uh, not natural in the sense of just living, how long can you live question. So, um, but nevertheless, if you do a fit to those points, it's, uh, it's, in, it's, in, it's consistent with this one quarter. Um, on, the other, on the other hand, there's great variance. Um, not surprising because I don't think natural selection, in my opinion, um, operated on lifespan. I don't think natural selection cared about maximum lifespan, how long you could live. Mm. It does care incredibly strongly that you live long enough. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, so for us, what does live long enough mean? Live long enough means you should live to about 40, 45 maybe. You should produce uh, maybe uh, 10 to 15 offspring mm -hmm. of which, I don't know, half of them, two thirds will survive. And that's the way it goes. And that's sort of how we were to varying degrees until maybe 100, 150 years ago. Mm -hmm. And indeed, the, the uh, expected lifespan of a human being across the planet, you just average across the planet, was about 35 in about 1850. Mm -hmm. um, around then, a little bit later, if you looked at the United States or Western Europe, United Kingdom, that number's more like 45, 40, 45. Yep. By the end, and, but then a tremendous change took place. And that change was driven primarily by the, um, first of all, the discovery of um, the, germ, the germ theory of disease. Yep. Uh, you know, there were such things. It wasn't all hocus pocus. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, and the, the, the coming of modern medicine, but even much more importantly, was the recognition that um, that we need to have sewer systems and people need to wash. Yep. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I speculate, maybe I've read, but I speculate that the vast majority of people hardly wash themselves, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe best once a week, once a month. Um, uh, they didn't have the opportunity or the, the uh, resources to do it unless you're an aristocrat and even then mm -hmm. um, you know I got just a side comment I you know in, in my undergraduate I was an undergraduate at Cambridge in England and the building the old ancient buildings had uh, almost no heat mm -hmm. and it gets quite cold and damp especially in Cambridge mm -hmm. uh, which is a marsh actually and um, I remember one of my undergraduate colleagues went the whole winter, Without any bathing at all, and you know, this is 1958, 59, not so long ago, right? And you know, and I, you know, people sort of, you know, certainly scoffed at it, but it wasn't like he wasn't sort of an outcast because of it, or you know, people understood it because of freezing cold. Anyway, so I think people didn't bathe very much. And, and so the introduction of sewage, sewage systems, mm -hmm. and uh, clean water had a phenomenal effect. And, uh, and by the way, that is intimately related with the growth of cities and the coming of the age of cities of urbanization. But anyway, that changed tremendously and lifespan took off. The expected lifespan, uh, the life expectancy, uh, took off dramatically from then on, and um, enhanced as those amenities improved and spread across the entire populace, and uh, and then of course were enhanced greatly by advances in medicine, which I don't think are equal. I mean, I think the advances in medicine still probably do not equal the advances made by sewage and hygiene. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, I don't know, but in particular lifestyle, I mean, the whole lifestyle change. So 
it, it's led to this idea that, gee whiz, yes, my great great grandfather may have only lived to 45 or 50 or whatever. Um, and, uh, yeah, but, uh, you know, my father lived, uh, you know, 72. And my grandfather was 68 and so on. And I'm, uh, you know, so maybe I can live to 100. And maybe there's no limit. Maybe I can live to 150, even you know, eventually. I mean, and so that has now become sort of part of the thinking. Um, now, if you look at the statistics, there's no controversy really that the oldest person that has ever lived lived to 100, almost 123. Is so it the French woman, right? She died in the late yeah, 90s. French woman. <laughs> yes, she died in the 80s. And it's been pretty much substantiated. She claims that she, she lived in the, the, the small town of Arles in southern France. And uh, she claims that she used to, when she was uh, about 14 or 15, she used to work in her uncle's store. And Vincent van Gogh would come in to buy supplies and paint and so on. <laughs> and uh, she makes nasty comments about it in her. <laughs> As this dirty young man, you know, it wasn't old, but it's dirty. Anyway, be that as it may. So no one has lived beyond that. And yeah. there are very few people that lived into that 120s. But increasingly, more and more people are living to 100. Right. And I'm probably an extremely good example. My grandfather died at 57, my father at 61, and I'm 81. Yeah, wow. So, you know, it's the, the, the goodness knows what the change is. But it does indicate, which many people believe, I think it's still somewhat controversial, genes only have a secondary effect, that it's your lifestyle and your environment that is dominant. Now, having said all that, going back to your question, we have a theory, and I'm a physicist, and bullshitting about how long you're gonna live without having a theory is not science in my opinion. <laughs> uh, you can bullshit, you could talk about aging and mortality and what kills you, but to put a number to it, you need a quantitative theory. And sure. that's, that's the point I wanna emphasize. And this is a potentially quantitative theory, let me say that at least. It does explain the scaling law and it indicates why it's of order 100 years that we live because one of the startling things about lifespan, like all these other scaling laws, is that a mouse, which is made of almost identical stuff as you and me. Mm -hmm. um, it's got almost identical genes, basically, otherwise it wouldn't be mammals. Um, only lives for about two years. Right. And, a, and a blue whale, um, also pretty much the same, um, lives for, again, that's been very hard to determine. So probably about 125. It's, mm -hmm. it's um, by the way, uh, just a tangential comment, one of the things, uh, maybe I should say is that one of the things the scaling laws say is that, you know, even though, um, you know, the mouse scurries around and we walk on two legs and the giraffe has a long neck and the elephant has a trunk and the whale lives in the ocean, we're actually, despite all those externalities, we're actually scaled versions of one another um, mm -hmm. in terms of any of these things that we can measure. Um, scaled versions of one another, and here's the point I should have emphasized maybe a little earlier when I used the word coarse grain, to sort of 85% level. You know, the other 10, 15 or so percent is because you have a trunk or, you know, you're, you've adapted to a very special, a special environment. But overwhelmingly, the scaling laws dominate. And one of the scaling laws, as I say, is lifespan. And there is a mechanistic theory. So what does this theory say? It doesn't say that um, you can't live beyond 123 years, although the data strongly suggests that. Mm. But what it says is there is a maximum lifespan. Mm. Mm. That is you do eventually, so here's the way it works. You, your cells are continually operating and they're con con um, creating damage. At the same time, all those fluids flowing through your body, in particular cardiovascular system, flowing through your body, cells flowing through small capillaries, 
and so on, pushing themselves, being pushed through. Just like the pipes in your house, they wear out. Mm. Of course, you repair. You uh, continue repairing. That's part of it. But natural selection has, has evolved us so that there's enough repair to comfortably live to be about 40 to 50 years old. After that, natural selection doesn't care. Mm -hmm. So the rest is a free ride, and we're now taking advantage of that. Mm. We've taken advantage of that free ride mm. uh, in being able to extend it by a factor of two almost so that people can live you now an expected lifespan of close to 80. Mm -hmm. So, um, but this theory says, that there is a maximum, we've evolved to do that. This theory says that there is a maximum lifespan. I suspect it is about 125 years because that's what the data says. And the theory, if you put in the numbers, gives something of order 100, but the theory is not good enough mm. quantitatively to give a precise number. Sure. So, um, <clears throat> uh, but, you know, so I think it might be possible. So how you could ask yourself, how in the hell can you, if you wanted to, which all the moguls and filthy rich in Silicon Valley want to do. They all want to live to at least 200, and many want to live forever. And I, I don't want to blame them, I guess. I mean, uh, but um, what can you do? Well, um, you can in, uh, inter intercede in the repair mechanisms. You can increase the amount of energy you give to repair. And that's all the stuff you hear about telomeres and so on. But if you could do things to increase your repair mechanisms, that will increase your, um, uh, uh, that would potentially increase your metabolic rate. But that's a very dangerous thing to do um, because um, you have evolved carefully to allocate or the energy to all the various organs and all the various functionalities in your body. And if you start fiddling with that, all kinds of unintended consequences may, mm. and I suspect will occur. Mm. And so you could have a scenario in which, yes, I can extend the lifespan beyond this, say 125 limit to 150 or 200, but you're sort of this, um, total couch potato, mm -hmm. you're just unable to move, or you're unable to do other things, or other other consequences develop. I don't mm -hmm. know what they are, but the other ways you can increase your lifespan, maybe not to hundred, not maybe not beyond 125, but maybe, um, you know, it's all driven by metabolic rate. It's all driven in mm -hmm. the way I've talked about it is damage, um, uh, wear and tear due to metabolism. Well, one thing you can do is decrease your metabolism. Mm. Well, that's also dangerous. Mm. I mean, if you decrease, if you cut your metabolism in half, you would increase your lifespan tremendously. But you wouldn't live to begin with. I mean, <laughs> you need a minimum amount of food. But what it says is that if you minimize the amount of food you need in order to, you know, to um, uh, live a reasonable life, you will live longer. And that's called caloric restriction. Mm. And it has been demonstrated in mice and so on. It's again, somewhat controversial. Some of the data isn't so clear. Some is very clear. Um, I'm not an expert in it. And there's one other way. There's one other wonderful way you can increase your lifespan. And that is to recognize something we haven't talked about. And that is the role of, of temperature on metabolism. Because we are almost, you know, we and birds and so on are almost unique in that we have this, we have the same, we keep our body temperature constant. Mm -hmm. That's been an enormous advantage in many things. But for everybody else on this planet, everything else that functions on this planet, they are incredibly sensitive to temperature. Mm. Um, and uh, they're all cold blooded and they all, um, rely on the sun warming them up so they can move around, many of them. So um, what, how does temperature affect metabolism? Why is it important? Well, temperature affects metabolism through changing the rates at which 
um, chemical reactions that produce your energy mm. are made in your cells. The higher the temperature, the faster that chemical reaction grows, the more the metabolism. You sort of you're heating up the system. Yeah, sort of obvious in a way. Um, so, and of course, if you do that, you increase the damage. If you were to do that, if you were to increase your body temperature, you would increase the damage and you die sooner. But the converse is also true. If you could decrease your body temperature, you would live longer hmm. in an exponential way. That's the other important thing. It's extremely sensitive to temperature. And indeed, if you look at the data on cold-blooded organisms, from fish all the way through to zooplankton and so on, and you look at their lifespan as a function of temperature, they follow this law exactly, hmm. follow this exponential law. Now, we have a fixed temperature. Now, maybe one could still function if you lowered it from the conventional 98.6 to, I don't know, 96.6, and you could function you would decrease the damage and potentially you could live longer. Hmm. And by the way, one tangential statement to this, that huge, incredible exponential sensitivity to change in temperature is why a change of one or two degrees in the ambient global climate hmm. is enormous. Mm -hmm. Because if you're my mum and you were still alive, my mom would say to me, who gives a shit about one or two degrees? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Changes, I live in a place here which changes by almost 40 degrees during the day in the summer. Why should we care about you know, a few degrees? It's because as a background ambient temperature, all metabolism increases mm. by exponentially. Everything speeds up. Mm. But more importantly, because everything speeds up and everything co-evolved, everything gets out of whack. And so something, as people say, some things might improve, actually. Mm. Of that, but most things will be uh, deleterious. Sorry, I went on a long answer. No, no, no. That's that's great because you, you answered like three other questions I had. So that's one thing. <laughs> that was so, all part of it. Yeah, it's well, great. But by the way, that's a very important point. One of the things that, that I very much enjoy, but is incredibly integral and important about this work, is that you can't answer one question of its own. <laughs> right. It's realizing connected. everything to connect it. Yeah, yeah. And it, it does express that extraordinary interrelationship and interconnectedness of all of nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's fascinating, the idea of temperature and, and metabolism and things we kind of know about, but, but understanding it in terms of the physical properties in terms of scaling, it, it, it's interesting to see how all of these things have a very kind of simple, well, a simplicity to them within that complexity. The the I want to get to cities. Uh, so to kind of tee us up for that, I'll give you uh, some runway on this. Yeah. What are what are uh, fractal fractals? Uh, is this something you talk about in the book? Um, yeah. And how are they important for scale within and between systems? You talk about this idea of living things occupy 3D space, but their internal physiology and anatomy operate in, operate in 4D space. So tell us how all this works and, and fractals. Yeah. So one of the things I didn't say, you know, I, I skipped over uh, when I talked about networks as the underlying theory, the physics and mathematics networks as the underlying origin of these scaling laws. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it was these sort of generic universal properties of networks that gives rise to the universal properties of the scaling laws, was that what the mathematics tells you is that the, these networks, when they're optimized, then are fractals, or at least approximate fractals. So now I'm going to tell you what a fractal is. Mm -hmm. Most people are familiar with fractals, even if they don't even know the term. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'm sure I've been intrigued by it, actually. And uh, the, the classic one, of course, is to look at a tree and see all its branching networks. You know, got, there's the trunk, it goes into two or three branches, and they branch into other things. And this thing sprays out mm -hmm. um, with the leaves at the end. Um, that is a classic fractal in the sense that, and I'm, I'm sure many people have 
or do, maybe you've done this, if you cut a branch somewhere in the middle of that tree and take it away and put it, stick it in the ground, it looks like a little tree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And indeed, it is a scaled down version of that tree from which it came. Mm. And um, in the same way, another classic example is a, is a, is a big broccoli, big mm -hmm. head of broccoli. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, you pull off one crown of it and you put it aside. It looks like a little version of the broccoli. And indeed it is. And in fact, you know, you can do the experiment. You can take a photograph of the original broccoli big head of broccoli, take off a crown, and put it down and take a photograph of that. And then just on your iPhone, expand it. Mm -hmm. And it looks like the original piece of broccoli. Mm -hmm. That's a fractal. Mm -hmm. Now, the scaling is nonlinear in the sense I talked about before. It's not that everything go, you know, if you double size of something, um, uh, double the size of the system, everything doubles up. It doesn't does it in a nonlinear way. And um, it does it um, according to um, specific scaling laws and uh, with varying exponents, which are called the fractal exponent. It's the analog to the three quarters and so on mm -hmm. that I talked about earlier. Um, and it's a geometric property of the system. It would be a geometric property of the tree, of your circulatory system, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so on. I think and of uh, I think of fungi. Fungi do this, right? They also absolutely. have like a, a massive network. They're interconnected. Absolutely. You take one apart. It's kind of analogous to the whole thing. The whole I, thing. The, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's that. That kind of, the, the fractals are ubiquitous throughout nature. I mean, river networks. Look at river networks. There's a two-dimensional version of that. River networks are approximately fractals. Mm. So um, that, that's one of the nice things about the theory. It sort of predicts that fractals. Um, are, the, uh, are the optimum configuration. And so these systems have tried to optimize in some way because of the continuous feedback coming from um, sort of uh, survival of the fittest, the natural selection. Mm -hmm. And um, they give rise to these fractal structures, um, which are ubiquitous across all of nature. And uh, some, some of your listeners may I've heard of the name of uh, men in Mandelbrot. Benoit Mandelbrot was a ma mathematician who first uh, brought this to attention. He didn't discover them, but he was the one that recognized their ubiquity and that they were a um, you know in, um, integral across all of nature. Wherever you looked, you saw these kind of fractal-like structures, hmm. um, even in clouds. By the way. I mean, hmm. Hmm. Um, so, um, and, and he also started proposing some mathematics underlying it and so on, uh, but he never, he, he left it at that. He didn't ask about the origin of them. What's the physical origin, the mechanistic origin. Hmm. Anyway, um, so fractals play a crucial role and um, they, uh, they underlying all of biology, um, but they also play a crucial role underlying cities. Cities mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. That's our segue into uh, cities. Mm -hmm. And um, but before talking about their fractal structure, I'd just like to say the first thing, one of the things I did when I, when I was working on this biology, um, it became very clear that a natural extension was indeed to cities and social organizations in general, like, like companies, mm -hmm. uh, because they're network systems, of course. And there's, I mean, energy is flowing through them. And they are sort of, I mean, cities have often been compared to organisms anyway. Um, so it was very natural. And eventually um, I put together a, a, a collaboration of a different collaboration of, um, uh, of, 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 of physicists and urban geographer, urban um, economists, um, anthropologists, and so on, people who are more into the social sciences. Um, to start uh, trying to analyze cities mm. and uh, in, in this within this framework. And one of the first things we did, unlike in biology, where um, all the kind of uh, phenomenology, phenomenological analysis of data to get the scaling laws had actually been done, a large part of it before us, for cities, this hadn't been done. Mm. And so we had to first check 
us to city scale. That is, um, you know, is um, New York a scaled up Los Angeles, which is a scaled up Chicago, which is a scaled up Cleveland, which is a scaled up Santa Fe, which is right. Um, even though they look different, they're in different geographies, they're mm -hmm. different histories, mm -hmm. even different cultures. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, nevertheless, the, 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 uh, the elephant and the whale don't look much alike, but they're scaled versions of one another. So um, my young colleagues got hold of big data sets on all this stuff. And again, to cut a long story short, discovered wonderfully that cities scale. And the first thing, one of the first things we looked at were things like um, number of restaurants in a city <laughs> or uh, the length of the roads uh, and so on, sort of infrastructural kinds of things. Many, many of them were infrastructure, number of gas stations, for example. Yeah. And we discovered very early on that they do scale. They scale uh, just as like in biology, um, uh, the same kind of thing. If you plot them logarithmically, you plot the, the met whatever the metric is versus the size of the city and its population, but on this logarithmic plot going up by factors of 10, you find approximate straight lines. There's much more variance, I would say, much more variance around the straight line, but nevertheless, it's very clear, uh, very strong evidence of scaling. And what we discovered very quickly was that in terms of infrastructure, infrastructural metrics, um, uh, not all infrastructural metrics scaled, scaled in the same way, which was sort of interesting. Gas stations, length of the roads, length of the electrical lines, um, the gas lines, buildings, and so on, all scaled in the same way, and they scaled with a similar sublinear characteristic as biology, namely the bigger you are, the less roads you need per capita, the less electrical lines, the less gas stations, and so on, all to the same degree. And here was what was amazing, anywhere across the world where we saw, where we could find data, they scaled in the same way, sort of again expressing this kind of commonality that mm -hmm. we've seen in um, biology. There were, and, there, were, there were two visuals in your book that were really nice in illustrating this. You, you give a, in the book, you, you show one picture of the organic growth of Paris, which is a beautiful city, yes. um, which shows this kind of fractal-like geometry. You have kind of like a nucleus and yes. there's the center of it and then it, 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 it spawns out. <clears throat> and then you show next to that picture a bacterial colony. Yes. And it almost looks like a, a carbon yes. copy of it. Right. Further, you talk about the interstate system in the United States, which I thought this was, I never, like I never thought about this, but it, it, all of the, the, the flows uh, by, yes. by truck go to and from like this kind of center, I guess you could say probably Dallas and that was Laredo. That would be Laredo, Texas. Yeah. <laughs> and then it just spawns out from that all yeah. throughout the uh, Southwest yeah. and then Midwest. And, and it, it I mean, the, the visuals held to it. And then as you were explaining it, cause my, my critical hat was like, okay, you know, Jeffrey's saying all these really wonderful things about biology. I get it. But how does this work with cities? It possibly, it can't yeah. possibly, they're all different. All cities are different. Yeah. No way. And then, and then you just start seeing the fractals and it's like, oh, it's always been there and I never saw it. And That's it's, right. it's, so it's, it's amazing. So in cities in particular, so for in biology, it's sort of obvious. I mean, there's mm -hmm. so many obvious examples and yeah. you're familiar with it. And as I say, trees and broccoli, but even pictures you've seen of your cardiovascular mm -hmm. system, it's sort Certainly. of obvious. But, but uh, the thing I showed in the book that you refer to is um, a map of the United States um, highway system. And it looks like sort of, you know, some random agglomeration of roads and sort of spaghetti, mm -hmm. loose spaghetti intertwined, but no, no real structure. But then if you t choose a major city or a city like Laredo, I happen to have to be Laredo. <laughs> and then you count that in particular case, because you can get it from the Department of Transportation, the truck traffic out of Laredo to all parts of the United States. And you just plot, you just put that on the graph and you make the thickness of the road be the volume of truck traffic. 
so that the first road coming out of Laredo is very fat because that's where all the trucks leave. Mm -hmm. And then as it spawns out, it gets thinner and thinner. If you look at that, as you say in the book, it looks like your insides. Mm -hmm. looks like, you know, a classic cardiovascular system. Mm -hmm. But the point here is that it's hidden. Mm. We're not aware of that. And right. that's true of cities uh, themselves. Um, work before I got into this, um, the, the work, a, lo a lot of work had been done on the fractal nature of cities, mm -hmm. looking for things like this. Um, and to see that hidden underneath what looks like sort of this mess, <laughs> this sort of arbitrary mess, lies this regularity. And that's true. I should have said that even in, in biology. You know, one of the things that we did was to um, analyze forests, was to do the, the mathematics and physics of forests as a network. Mm. Um, you know, the trees aren't connected, but they do have to share the same resources, the sun and the rain and so on. And that forms a network. And that network you don't see. But in fact, it tells you how the trees that look like it's a random distribution of different sizes is not. It's an incredibly regular distribution of sizes of trees in the forest. And you don't see that. You have to go out and measure them and then so on. So it is with cities. So our cities actually have a sort of regular fractal-like um, structure built into them, both in terms of their infrastructure, and here's the next point, in terms of their social networks, the way we interact with each other. So so here's my, I want to get to that point, but here's the question I have about that. So maybe it's, it makes sense, I mean, maybe for other people it doesn't, but for what, what, what we understand about natural selection, about, you know, laws of the universe, uh, the material world, okay, that makes sense, I guess. There's, there's less... Um, uh, potential intentionality behind it, I guess you could say, uh, of sorts. I, I'm meaning that in a kind of um, anthropocentric way. But with humans, we have people that plan and develop cities. We have people that are urban yeah. development. We th There's an intention behind this. How could this be with cities where there's intention? Okay, we're going to put a city here. We're going to put a shopping mall here. We're going to put condominiums here. There's, there. I mean, there's basics of urban planning. Like, then and Again, the con the contents of it, uh, you know, Singapore looks different than you know, Monte Carlo. That looks different than uh, London. That looks different from New York. So, how do we how do we find this? Even though humans are designing these cities, how does that happen? Yeah. So this is a very good question, and I have to unpack it a bit. Okay, please. So first of all, I want to before addressing it directly, I do want to talk about the socioeconomic piece. Okay. And, uh, and the um, social networks. Because I just, the thing I told you about was that cities satisfy scaling laws, um, uh, just like biology, um, for the infrastructure, their sort of physicality, if you mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't also, what I didn't say, I realized was that slope, instead of being three quarters, 0.75 is 0.85. Mm -hmm. So the saving every time you double the size of a city on the roads is instead of 25%, as it would be in biology, is 15%. Mm. But there's this systematic saving sure. as you get bigger and bigger on all infrastructure. So bigger cities are more efficient than small towns um, in terms of the infrastructure. Now, it turns out this is the least interesting, the less interesting part of the city. The most interesting part of the city, of course, is its socioeconomic activity mm -hmm. because that's why cities are there in the first place. Uh -huh. Cities are there, cities have evolved as this most marvelous machine for encouraging and facilitating social interaction so that we can produce ideas, innovate, create wealth in order to increase standards and quality of life. And in that sense, they've been enormously successful. Um, so, and all of that happens. So the infrastructure is the stage Mm. facilitate for making this happen. That's why great cities have gathering places. They have theaters and uh, um, sports stadiums and lecture halls and big office buildings and universities to bring people together in a kind of cauldron to really um, increase social interaction and therefore increase ideas and so forth. 
Um, so, uh, in, in, so cities have evolved um, with um, being driven by trying to maximize, in a certain sense, social interaction. Mm -hmm. And um, the social networks uh, that uh, we participate in um, are, are integrated, of course, with the infrastructure, because you have to sit in a place, you have to be on a bus, you have to go from A to B and so on. So you're integrated with it. Um, but the astonishing thing about social networks that makes them completely different than biological networks, and all the networks I've talked about before, including the infrastructural networks of cities, like its transport system, is that they are um, they, they have positive feedback in them. When people get together, A talks to B, who talks to C, who talks to A, and we build on each other. We, we, of course, most of the building produces not very interesting ideas for most people, but it is that dynamic that leads to the theory of quantum mechanics or the invention of uh, the automobile or Google or Amazon. That's how it begins. You have to, you have that. It doesn't happen. Um, let's face it. Microsoft did not happen because Bill Gates went up onto the top of the mountain and came back and uh, <laughs> right, right. You know, it happened because he was in a highly contagious, highly interactive environment, and he brought a, a bunch of people came together. And uh, you know, theories things do not. You know, as Newton said. If I have seen further, it is because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I mean, and so that is what a city does. It produces that. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at socioeconomic metrics, that positive feedback in uh, social networks leads to instead of the bigger you are, the less per capita, um, dominating biology, economies of scale, sublinear scaling, you get the bigger you are, the more per capita the more interactions per capita, the more ideas per capita, and in fact, measure the number of patents produced per capita increases. But so do all other um, um, uh, creative things, like the amount of crime increases per capita, the amount of disease increases per capita, and so on. So all the good, bad, and the ugly things associated with socioeconomic activity all increase together. And amazingly, when you look at the data, they all increase in the same way increasing scaling when plotted logarithmically with a slope of approximately 1.15. Meaning that if you double the size of a city within an urban system, then you'll get twice as much social interactions. Oh, I'm sorry. If you double, let me start again. If you double the size of a city within an urban system, you get more than twice the number of interactions. You get this 15% added, but you get that 15% added for the number of patents it produces, the amount of crime that happens, the amount of disease that happens, mm -hmm. and uh, you know the amount of fancy restaurants and the, the GDP all increase approximately in the same way by this 15%, and that's all driven by this dynamics of social networks. And it's kind of extraordinary, and it's the same scaling around the world. Now, I have to amend that with one thing, so the same scaling. So if you look in Japan, you'll see the same scaling of these metrics. If you look in um, Argentina, or if you look in Spain, you'll see the same thing. Now, the one caveat is, this is only between cities within the same urban system. Mm. That is, it, it doesn't compare Tokyo with New York. It compares New York with Chicago and Boise. Uh, and compares to, um, Tokyo with Osaka and Kyoto. Uh, so, uh, and indeed, but if you looked at the scaling, they would be exactly the same. That is, the scaling between Tokyo, Osaka, and Kyoto is the same as between um, New York, San Francisco, and Santa Fe. Um, but the overall scale will be different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So within 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 the within the uh, because the culture is the same. I mean, because yes. we all we all are part of that same social network. Mm -hmm. So how does 
So this is intentional, though, in terms of how cities are. Uh, yes, I didn't ask. Yes, I didn't answer your question. <laughs> your wonderful question. It is a wonderful question because here it has. So what is amazing about this is that it's happened organically. It's mm-hmm. happened by the whole process of social interaction. That's why I was saying all this. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. By social interaction and the and the um, evolutionary pressures, if you like inherent in our social interactions and our socioeconomic systems. Um, And that transcends all of the planning and all of the politicking and all of the designs, which of course do affect things locally, obviously they affect, and indeed they may even affect, you know, how how close to the scaling line an individual city is. No city lies, very few cities lie exactly on the scaling. variances and deviations of course uh, among them but um they uh but this this process this whole process of social interaction um uh, overcomes if you like uh, the 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 designing aspect of it so for example so there's a very interesting expression of that and that is Think of cities that have been designed that haven't evolved organically. I mean, been Washington major... D.C. is is one of them. It's a Washington. Design. It's a city that's oh, designed. One. Washington D.C., Brasilia, Islamabad, <laughs> Canberra, and so on. If you read about all of those, they all have exactly the same characteristic. They're boring, soulless cities that no one enjoys living in. Now that was true of Washington, D.C., I would say until about 20 years, it's taken about 100 years mm-hmm. for Washington, the, or the, the organic forces to overcome the, the constraints that the original designers of Washington put on it. And in the same way, Brasilia, which has been around maybe, I don't know, I'm guessing 50 odd years, is just beginning to become a real city. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you read all the accounts of those cities, and the people I know, I've known people that live in these places, mm-hmm. they all say the same thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and so, the, so the whole point of this, in a way, from a practical viewpoint, is if you're going to either design a city, whether a small town or a major metropolis eventually, or if you're going to mitigate questions or develop an area in a city, know these scaling laws and know what underlies them. No, that don't work against them because that's what these people have been doing. Work with them. Work with the scaling laws because those are the natural forces of nature. It's interesting because, you, well, I, I have a question about the social networks of this in a minute, but I just want to ask one, I guess, footnote here. Your, your book is about cities, but um, what isn't, I guess, uh, uh, as significantly emphasized here is what about rural areas or very small towns and villages and yeah. cities both i mean that's been around for hunter gatherers yeah. and all the way into yeah. to currently right you know you have a small town in middle america or up in, in in certain parts of you know united kingdom or wherever you know you have these small towns and villages how does that factor into this idea of uh, cities and scaling and, and, and such yeah so that's, a, that's also a very good question um uh, that relates also to another question that is sort of related to it, and that is um, the history of this. Mm-hmm. Because 200 years ago, at the founding of the United States, this city, this, uh, this, uh, this country, like all, all countries, was overwhelmingly rural. Yeah. I mean, it was, I don't know what, I forget the numbers now, it was 90% lived in what we would now call rural or small villages, small towns, Mm -hmm. small communities. Mm -hmm. Now I think it's something like 82% of Americans live in metropolitan, what are called metropolitan areas. Um, One of the great myths, by the way, this is a tangential editorial comment. One of the great myths of many people in this country is the the myth of the small town Mm. uh, of America, you know, small town America, which basically does not exist. I mean, it does exist, of course, but uh, it used to exist and was dominant, but it's no longer. 
um, um, and people who live in cities still think that they, parts of cities think they live in small towns, but they live in a big city. Anyway, that's an editorial comment. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, uh, so there's been this incredible transition that's taken place um, and it's taken place worldwide. And indeed, you know, now more than half of the people on this planet live in cities. Mm -hmm. And that will increase to the 70 or 80%, you know, in the next 50 years, uh, moving ahead at some extraordinary rate. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but one of the frustrating things about this work has been that we can't get hold of historical data. Mm. Um, you know, you would hope to have had similar data that we have now, and most of our data doesn't go back. I think the, uh, the furthest back it goes is maybe to the 60s. But it would be wonderful to get data from, you know, 1910, 1810, medieval Europe, and so on. A similar kind of, it just doesn't, it, it, it exists probably in principle. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, you know, how do you actually get, how do you filter it all out? Anyway, mm -hmm. um, now um, this is coming through the back door to your answer your question. Mm -hmm. um, some of my young colleagues, um, one of my major collaborators on this, Louis Bettencourt, who runs a big um, uh, institute in the University of Chicago now, um, he and one of our young postdocs at the time, who's now at the, the Scott Norman, who is now at the University of Colorado, um, an anthropologist, um, looked at data from a pre-Columbian urban system in Mexico. Mm. Now, I may get these numbers a little bit wrong, but I think it was of the order of 40 or 50, you could call them cities, but they're really villages. It goes to your point, these are small, mm -hmm. as you might imagine, this is pre-Columbian times, mm -hmm. um, small, small towns at best, but small settlements. Yeah. And they used archaeological data, of which I am no expert, uh, to, to um, make proxies for various socioeconomic activities. So you look at number of pot shards, you look at areas, about, you know, whatever the <laughs> methodologies are with the archaeology we use. And then they plotted this in the same way we've done this, namely um, asking how do these change with city size, city meaning these settlement. And they found very, um, which is very satisfying, that it scales with the same experience, 1.15. That was amazing. Now, yeah. I think it's been a bit controversial. I haven't followed this carefully, but you know, I like it, obviously. And uh, I thought it was a very brave attempt mm -hmm. uh, to do so. But it would be wonderful to get such data for you know, small town America over the years. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we did look, so I, probably people don't know this, but um, American towns and cities are classified in two broad categories. One is called metropolitan statistical areas, mm -hmm. which are big cities. Um, I think the cutoff used to be 50,000. People. People. Mm -hmm. I think it's now increased to 100,000. Mm -hmm. I know that whatever it is increased, Santa Fe is at risk of no longer being considered a metropolitan area. But it, <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter. But you can imagine, and there's about 365 of such areas in the United States. Uh -huh. And that's where our data, all the things I've talked about in terms of the United States were from data from metropolitan statistical areas, MSAs. Mm -hmm. And by the way, just to emphasize again, we have lots and lots of data from obviously Europe and Latin America, Asia, China, Japan, and so on. Uh, show all these similar qualities. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the other broad category is called micropolitan areas. This is called areas. And um, their towns are 50,000 and under. Mm -hmm. and we did an analysis of those. And what was interesting was that there was much greater variance. Because you can imagine, I mean, if you have town, little, if you have small towns of 5,000 or 10,000, mm -hmm. there's all kinds of special characteristics then start to like, dominate um, you know, and so on, where their proximity to a big city matters, 
and so on, much more than what happens for these big metropolitan areas. Mm -hmm. And yet, when we looked statistically at the fit of those, it was consistent with these 1.15, but it had much greater variance. Mm -hmm. Huge, very, sure. lots of variance. So, so that sort of substantiated, or at least I shouldn't say substantiated, it suggests that the same dynamic that's going on in big cities is also going on in small towns. Mm -hmm. But it's not so different, mm -hmm. and that maybe we shouldn't even make that distinction that it is, roughly speaking, a continuum. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but it does require another thing associated with that is also the deconstruction of a city into neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Same kind of question. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, what about neighborhoods? Because city is not obviously is very far from being homogeneous. We treat it sure. as homogeneous, and so we've started looking at that. That's also extremely difficult. Sure. Because getting data on that, defining no one defines a neighborhood. What what is a neighborhood? Mm -hmm. so it's mostly intuitive in the, in certainly in colloquial speech, but even in uh, you know urban planning and so on, it's it's not very well defined. We have so, these other well, things called uh, in the United States called unincorporated areas. Exactly, <laughs> it's exactly. very sprawling. There's no limits to it. Exactly. It's like very difficult so to kind of pin there's down. There's all these peripheral issues which are important. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, I mean, this is really, I mean, what we have done is the beginnings of something. Mm -hmm. Where we're we're trying to establish a science or physics of cities. That is, you know, more is quantitative, principle, analytic, even predictive, and it's complementary. It's not to replace what's been done, quite sure. contrary, sure. To, to, but to be complementary to the more qualitative, narrative-oriented um, style of the social sciences of urban planning um, and even urban geography um, mm -hmm. and, and urban e economics. Mm -hmm. So it's. Um, but in a certain sense, it's still the beginning, and there's lots to do, and uh, I think it's very exciting. Yeah, no, I, I, I would absolutely agree. But, but, it, but it does play, but I think it's an incredibly important question, uh, not just because the, you know, in our country, and certainly in all developed countries, the uh, overwhelming majority of people live in cities, mm -hmm. and we need to understand them, and come to terms with them, things are changing rapidly, mm -hmm. but, um, uh, you know, more and more, the overwhelming majority of people in the world are going to be living in cities, and the whole sustainability of the globe is, in fact, the question of cities. I mean, that's crucial. Yeah. You know, we need to be, and, and we need to concentrate more and more on that. Mm. I I, to I totally agree, and especially in the way in which you're quantifying it. I have uh, I have two final questions for you. Uh, they're big ones, I guess, but, uh, how do we under what, one of the, the, the common threads here is that people make up cities or they're the, sure. they're the, the life force or the energy of cities, you know, intentionally or unintentionally. Um, I know, um, Nicholas Christakis, he does a lot of work on oh, sure. uh, social networks and, sure, and things. Yeah, he's very, great. very interested in that as very, well. Very, and he's done some yeah. fantastic research. Um, so how do we just understand, I guess, the social networks that work with within many different types of cities, you know, within one uh, a system, if you will, kind of you're saying within the US or, you know, with Japan. Um, and then the final question after that is um, just give us the the, 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 the final uh, landing pad on what the grand unified theory of cities and sustainability is uh, oh, uh, for, for you. <laughs> well, the first thing. Um is, is uh, you know, we treat networks in a very um, generic way, I would say. Um, it goes to this, that's why I, I'm glad we, we started getting into these different, uh, digging deeper a little bit in the last 15, 20 minutes. Uh, and that's why I brought up neighborhoods, mm -hmm. because, you know, network, the, the city isn't a, um, I saw homogeneous, it's not homogeneous, and therefore the social network is obviously not homogeneous. And it does um, 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 devolve into um, uh, different kinds of networks depending on neighborhoods, but also in terms of functionality and jobs and so on. So it's quite complex and complicated. And um, 
But those play, as far as we can tell, those play a subdominant role in the overall scaling phenomenon. Now, they will play an important role in the individuality of a city. You know, what, what, why a city, why has New York got the character it has versus San Francisco? Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's one of the characteristics that one would be very interested in is, you know, some of these more detailed aspects of uh, the social networks and how they deconstruct into different aspects of social networks. What we use is just the generic structure of, of networks. So it's very crude, actually, um, and their fractal structure. Um, that, um, you know, the, the, uh, it's sort of obvious, it's a bit controversial, um, you know, this kind of work that, um, you know, if you ask uh, um, how many people is the, av uh, is the average person really close to, you know, really is your bosom buddy, you tell your deepest secrets if you need it to, that's mm -hmm. feel comfortable. And that number is sort of five or six, it's yep. some small number, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it sort of makes sense. It's sort of the core of a family, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then if you ask, well, what about, you know, those that you were, you know, friends, good friends, you go to dinner with them, you meet a party, you go to parties and see them daily and colleagues, that number is about 15. Mm -hmm. Then uh, if you ask about people that, you know, a little bit further out, you would see them at parties, you'd say hi to them, you'd discuss a few things, uh, discuss a football match with them or, or whatever, you know, and that number's about 50. And so it goes. There's this sort of decreasing strength of connectivity mm -hmm. as you increase, but the numbers increase accordingly and they increase in a fractal-like fashion. Mm -hmm. That is, you notice it was 5, 15, 45. It goes up by factors of 3, and so on. And and in fact, know, there, sorry, there's there's research that shows that uh, from, from, from different uh, psychologists that will show that people will actually invest more right. to maintain a close relationship, even if they move far away, even if there's something that kind of divides them or there's some space, uh, rather than uh, you know, having 10 new friends that are, yeah. are more acquaintances, the, the, the yeah. close ones, you're going to put more time and energy yeah. investment, even if it's just one yeah. or two people. Yeah. In fact, this work was, um, uh, you know, a, a person that uh, put it forward and has proposed it and pushed it very hard is a man, is a psychologist, uh, Robin Dunbar at Oxford, hmm. um, who has done this. And anyway. It's, it's controversial and it's a little bit, you know, it's very hard, well, obviously, because it's very hard to measure, if you like, to, yeah. to truly substantiate. Um, I like it very much because if it's very well in with our picture of what's going on, it doesn't necessarily need that, but it's an it's, it's a, it's, it's a important component. Okay, so, you know, I don't have a lot to say about the networks. It's, a, it's an area that requires much more research, much more detailed research and so on. And, and by the way, of course, ironically, um, much of the origins of modern social science uh, were done on looking in this language networks within cities, mm -hmm. you know, with surveys and so on in traditional ways. Yeah. Now we have looked at the network, uh, and I should have said this maybe earlier because it substantiates a lot of our work by using uh, mobile phone data, cell phone data, mm -hmm. realizing that, um, you know, which many people have used now, um, that we're all carrying around this detector. Yes. So we know everything about you. Yes, yes. You know, and we were, we, we had a, this wonderful collaboration with, with my friend uh, Carlo Ratti, who's an architect at uh, MIT, yeah. who got hold of all this, these, these, these humongous data sets, you know, big, huge data sets of telephone calls. Mm -hmm. uh, and we started, and that's how we traced out networks and some of these network effects. Nick, Nick did the same thing. He, 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 oh, used, he used Nick. Yes, absolutely. It became a big thing. thing. Mm -hmm. The funny thing is, and I talk about this in my book, actually, when Carlo approached me about this, I said, oh, that's ridiculous. You know, that's a lousy <laughs> proxy and so on. I don't believe it. Of course, that was at a time when, uh, you know, a minority of people had cell phones. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, but he kept stressing to me at the time, well, look, but in Africa, where we do have data, 80% of the people have them. So it's maybe a good proxy. Anyway, he 
I eventually turned around and I became a big enthusiast. <laughs> and indeed, many social scientists now, of course, mm -hmm. do, of course, use it. And, and it's much harder to get hold of the data and so on. It's, it's proprietary issues and mm -hmm. privacy. Mm -hmm. you know, anyway. <clears throat> so, um, but that, so that's my answer. It's not a very satisfactory one about the networks, but it is an area that requires a great deal more work, mm -hmm. I think. Um, but but oh, I, uh, one last thing on that though, before I go to the second question, and that is that one of the things that many, that almost all, I would say, people who do network analyses ignore is the city. Mm. That is, or to put it in a slightly different way, that you know they draw these marvelous diagrams. So you know you have a node which is a person, and then all the lines connecting them to their friends and so on. And they're just these topological pictures. But of course, what is neglected in that is each one of those nodes, each one of those people has to be somewhere. Mm. You know, you have to be in your office, you have to be on the toilet, I don't know, you have to be on, in, in your kitchen. You have to be in space. You have to be somewhere you to be in, in space. space. You have to be in place. You have to be somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that is constraining that. It's not arbitrary. It's not, you know, you can't just have arbitrary social networks because you've got to get from A to B. Mm -hmm. You also have to go take your kids to school. So there's these social constraints mm -hmm. on the structure. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's just a side comment and mm -hmm. something I feel quite strongly about because it's crucial in the theory of the city. Well, I, I won't, uh, we won't go down this tangent. Maybe, maybe this will be a, no. another conversation later, but um, the phenomenology of space is something that's really interesting to me. Yeah, me um, too. of how we understand uh, what what is that experience like to be in space we can maybe understand the physical properties of it but how do we understand space itself and then how we have that experience of what it's like to be in space and how we are in the world and in and, and different ways of, of thinking about that and I think when you think about that it it's a, it's a, it's a, it's such an abstraction, but it's something that's super, super real. An example of that is, you know, many, many people <laughs> recognize this without recognizing it of during the pandemic, uh, when many people were in lockdown, they had to do everything working out, eat, yeah. work, leisure, et cetera, Absolutely. in the same space. Yes, and exactly. that has impact on Absolutely. your interactions with other people, much less, or not to say the least for your psychological uh, 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 impact. And we, we find that the, the dimensions and limits of space and the experience of that at a phenomenological level have far powerful utility that we just don't even recognize. Yes. And uh, there's there's just a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot there, there's a lot of utility oh, there. Absolutely, so. no, as I say, so so it's one of the things I, I often stress because it's mostly neglected. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, certainly just from my urban perspective, let alone the kinds of things you're talking about, which are uh, a part of our social life and uh, psychology. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it plays a, just a really crucial role. Yeah. And we need to spend more time thinking about it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So, so to the last question, uh, 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 land, land at home for us. What is the, the grand unified theory of cities well, and sustainability? I, I think you devote the last chapter. Uh, yeah, on this. I sort of, so. <laughs> yeah, I sort of left it all hanging in the last. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a it's an anticlimactic ending, right? Is it kind of well, just I, this I sort of built up because one of the things. So let me very quickly go through this. We didn't talk about the growth of cities, but it works in the same way as the uh, growth uh, as a template, the growth of um, organisms. That is, you have something now called. So I'm going to go through this very quickly. Sure, sure, Social sure. metabolic rate, which you can imagine is sort of some generalization of your metabolic rate. Your metabolic rate is sort of the food you eat. Um, but, uh, you know, what's the, the, the city has food, obviously, it has energy coming in and, and, uh, and, and all the multiple things that is part of what a city is. Mm -hmm. So that's social metabolic. And it's all the metric, many, most of the metrics I talk about that scale. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and that gets apportioned between, on the one hand, repair, and maintenance of the stuff that's already there. You have to repair the buildings and the roads. You have to repair the people. You have to have hospitals and doctors. So there's a repair component. 
And then there's a growth component. You uh, build new buildings, roads, you develop new areas, and then you, you know, you build new people you biologically and, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, by uh, immigration and so forth. Yeah. So you can write this down as an equation. It follows, as in biology, it's much more complicated and, uh, and it's much more conceptually challenging to truly define um, a metabolic rate of a city. But, you, but nevertheless, the crucial point is all of the metabolism of city is derived from these social interactions mm -hmm. in any case. And so they all scale in the same way. And that allows you to derive the growth trajectory of a city. Yeah. And here's what's interesting. Um, I said when I talked about mammals or animals, that um, that growth equation explains why did you grow quickly and then you stop. And the stopping is to do with the sublinear nature of the scaling of metabolism, the economy of scale. Mm -hmm. Now, if that were to be taken over, um, if you really believe that a city was some super organism and you just took that over, mm -hmm. that would be crappy because uh, in fact <laughs> it would violate, you know, I mean, that goes against all the uh, sort of paradigm of um, modern um, socioeconomic development. It's the thing, the great thing that we discovered at the end of the 18th century, the, the exploitation of fossil fuels and the discovery of capitalism and entrepreneurship and so on has allowed this huge explosion. And we have now this paradigm that you have to have open-ended growth. You know, um, presidents get into big trouble if it's not 2%, uh, it's not expanding exponentially is what it says. Right. If you're not always expanding exponentially, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not what an organism does. An organism stops. And indeed, that cessation of growth has a lot to do with the fact that the biosphere has been sustainable for two to three billion years. So how, what happens here? So it turns out the superlinear scaling, when you put it into that equation of metabolic rate being maintenance plus growth, gives rise to open-ended growth. So it's very pretty, it's very um, self-consistent and very satisfactory because mm -hmm. now the big framework is you have social networks, they have positive feedback, positive feedback gives the superlinear scaling, the bigger you are, the more you get per capita and superlinear scaling leads to open-ended growth. That's what we see. Mm -hmm. and so it's very nice, except it has a, um, um, a hidden problem. Um, and that is that um, two things. One is I haven't talked about. Um, in biology, the bigger you are, I mentioned pace of life slows down. In social networks of this kind, the bigger you are, the pace of life increases. So first of all, life is getting faster, which you yeah. certainly feel viscerally. Life gets faster. So there's already that problem that's getting faster. But worse, is that this open-ended growth has built into it something that we call technically a finite time singularity. And what does that mean in English? Finite time singularity simply means that as this thing grows, it will grow to some infinite, some socioeconomic metric like the GDP or the number of AIDS cases grows faster than exponentially and goes to infinity in some finite time, which is crazy. That is that in some time in the future, five years, 10 years, 500 years, socioeconomic metrics have become infinite, which is crazy. And of course, the theory tells you what happens, that if you get close to that singularity, you collapse, the system mm -hmm. collapses. Mm -hmm. So what do you do to get out of it? You realize that what you have to do is first of all, recognize that your growth has taken place within a given major paradigm shift or major innovation. You discovered bronze. That's, a, some, that's what we call it, the Bronze Age, um, the Iron Age. We have now the Computer Age, or we have the Internet Age. We have the Industrial Revolution. They sort of set the major paradigm. So what this says is that somewhere along this ex fast and exponential growth trajectory, you better make a paradigm shift. You better make a major new innovation. You better reinvent yourself. 
you better reset the boundary conditions and start over again. And indeed, if you look back on the history, that's exactly what we've done. Each time we've grown, we again make a major transition to something new. We discover coal, we discover oil, we invent computers, we invent the internet, and so on. This resets things. That's great, and that's what we've done. Except again, there's a major challenge, and that is that yes. We can do that. It's and maybe that's not surprising to many people. We need these sort of cycles of innovation. But what may be surprising is you have to do it faster and faster. Mm -hmm. Theory says that yeah, you can avoid it, but you have to do it faster and faster. And so the time between, um, you know, so just to give you an arbitrary example, it may have taken a hundred years to make a major innovation a thousand years ago. Now it takes fifteen years. Mm -hmm. So you've got to make that adjustment faster and faster. And the question, can you keep up with the accelerating treadmill of life? Mm -hmm. uh, are you going to have sort of a socioeconomic heart attack? And so mm -hmm. that's the big question. Mm -hmm. and it's a time issue. And the uh, question is what, is, what is it that's going to get you out of that? And how do you do that? And in my book, I sort of left it at that. Mm -hmm. I sort of left it to the reader to draw his or her own conclusions. Well, I had uh, sort of a challenge to think through what it might be. And that's my next phase. And that's what I'm very interested in now is really coming to terms with that and to really make it more precise. First of all, the whole argument more precise. Mm -hmm. And secondly, to start thinking about new scenarios, different scenarios, what it really means, should we take it seriously, and so on. I mean, all the indications seem to be that way. And by the way, I would, I totally speculate that this whole era, this whole bizarre political era we now live in, not just in the United States, the Trumpism and authoritarian sort of rule rearing its ugly head, it's across the globe, yeah. is somehow a reflection of this and some reflection of anxiety caused by this. Mm. And, and unconsciously, I mean, I, mm -hmm, obviously mm -hmm. this is total speculation. Sure, but, sure, yeah. It, you know, it's 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 so interesting. Like when, I mean, it, it's just a it's just a big credit to your your brilliance and how how wonderful you are explaining things. But you know, reading the book and hearing you talk about it, it, it it's so interesting. It's one of those things that it gets in your mind and it just doesn't leave. You can't unsee it. You can't unhear it. And uh, and for that, I'm I'm so grateful for that. The uh, the book is called Scale: The Universal Laws of Life, Growth, and Death in Organisms, Cities, and Companies, and it is fantastic. Where can people find this book? And where can people find you and all of your work? Yes, well, you can get it on Amazon, of course. I think the hard copy is now. Um, it seems to be uh, coming to its end. Mm. I'm not sure. I don't know if they're going to reprint or what they're going to do. I don't know. I haven't been in touch with them actually. Um, but there's, uh, there's, there's paperback is, is available. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, it is, it's translated into, I don't know, 15 or so languages. Oh, that's wonderful. Which has been nice. I mean, mm -hmm. it's weird to see it in Finnish, for example. <laughs> what does need now? And there are three Chinese versions. Oh, wow. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, but anyway. Um, so you can get it on Amazon, I'm pretty sure. Um, and it is in, I, I, apparently people keep telling me they do see it in bookstores mm -hmm. occasionally. Um, it's, um, uh, and what was the last question? Uh, where can people find you and your work? Oh, where find me? Yes, 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 yes. So I'm at the Santa Fe Institute and you can find me easily on the web. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm happy to, uh, you know, I, I'm not good at responding quickly. Um, <laughs> You may have discovered that. I no, don't you, you, you responded uh, you respond very quick. fast. <laughs> I'm, I'm very uh, mixed about it because I, I'm, you know, I'm a 20th century person and I've never really adapted to email and, mm -hmm. and um, even text messages, really. I mean, I do them all, but I like to write letters still. Mm -hmm. You know, I was brought up as a letter writer. Mm -hmm. and I can't get that out of my system somehow. So it takes me a while. Um, and, uh, but I'm willing, you know, if people want to ask questions or have comments or want to complain or criticize or whatever, 
and and certainly if they want to praise me, that's even better. And, uh, <laughs> Like you do, I mean, you were embarrassingly. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's credit credit to your hard work. It's oh, really, well, really is. But uh, yes, no, they can get me. Uh, I'm at the Santa Fe Institute. I'm on the web. I, um, I'm gbw at santa fe.edu. Um, and uh, I try to answer, but it's hard. I, I do get a lot of correspondence. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. Uh, Jeffrey, big, 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 big thanks to you for, for coming on and uh, for talking with us about your wonderful work and your and your book. And so I, I just can't say enough thanks. So I, I greatly well, appreciate it. Thank you, Xavier. I really appreciate you inviting me and for your good questions and to this dialogue. I really enjoyed it. And, uh, thank you. And, and especially for the flat, flattering of me, it's great. It's, it's always good to get good positive feedback. What can I say? <laughs> of course. Thank um, you. Thank I appreciate you. that too. Okay. Thank you.